Hello, my name is Lauren and welcome to the Theoretical YouTube channel where we just love animation. Disney, Pixar, DreamWorks, Don Bluth, Warner Brothers, Illumination, okay, maybe not Illumination, but otherwise all these companies and creators have truly defined our childhoods. And they will continue to do so until long after it becomes weird for a 19 year old to go see Frozen 2 by herself. But where did it all get started and how did we go from Mickey Mouse shorts to full length CGI epics? Well, what better way to honor a genre we all love than by diving in and exploring its convoluted past? Maybe you'll learn something, maybe you'll just enjoy the art. Either way, this is a brief history of animation. Well, I mean, as brief as we can make it, there's a lot of ground to cover here. Anyway, what is animation? I know it seems obvious, but bear with me here. Because it's not just a series of drawings played sequentially in order to simulate motion. Because otherwise, computer animation wouldn't count. But it does, so what exactly makes the distinction between animation and live action film? After all, they are both just running images through a projector quickly. Perhaps you could make the argument that it's the difference between photos and anything other than a photo. Like hand drawings, digital art, or fully computer generated images. But that's not quite right either. Because what about stop animation? Those are literally photos portrayed in the exact same way as normal film. So okay, let's look at this through a completely different lens. Why is it called animation? What does that mean? Well, according to whatever Google uses as its default dictionary, animation literally means the state of being full of life or vigor. Think of Frankenstein being reanimated from the dead. Animation is giving life to things that typically aren't alive. And how that represents itself on a screen is through motion. So then the difference between animation and normal or live action film is that it's bringing life to things that typically don't move by themselves. Like drawings, computer graphics, clay models, or in the case of my childhood, Star Wars Lego figurines. So now that we actually know what we're talking about, animation is older than film. What? I'm serious. Well, okay, I guess it depends on how you actually define film, but if you want to go with the most literal and obtuse definition, the invention of celluloid film, you know, the old plastic stuff, was in 1889 by Eastman Kodak. Yeah, that Kodak. And technically, according to most film historians, that is around the period of time when cinema and film was born. It wasn't really until the turn of the century that this rudimentary motion picture technology was rebranded as film. But animation is significantly older. In fact, perhaps thousands of years older. Look at cave paintings where animals had more than enough legs. Did ancient humans just not know how to count? Nope, this was actually done entirely on purpose, at least according to one interpretation, that these extra limbs were actually drawn so that when night falls and the cave grows dark, and when only certain parts of the image are lit by flickering firelight, the animal will appear to be moving. Boom! Animation! Okay, or how about a more obvious example of something like the zoetrope or the trotting horse lamp from about 1000 CE, which is still over a thousand years ago. Basically, this thing is a Chinese invention that uses the properties of heat and air to rotate a lamp depicting a scene, often of horses. It's kind of like that scene from The Greatest Showman, but not really. A zoetrope, on the other hand, was a toy popularized in the 1830s and consisted of another spinning cylinder. These slits on the side restrict your viewpoint so that you can only see one image at a time. This creates the illusion of motion. Or maybe you think shadow plays are animation. There's a great argument there. And it's hard to argue against the magic lantern, right? This early projection technology actually predates the photograph and yet still has the ability to simulate motion in its slides. All you needed was light and a few images. Heck, 
heck, these things were even being used in the 18th century to project onto smoke and make it look like rooms were being haunted by ghosts. That's hologram technology right there. After that, there's even more inventions with even more difficult names to pronounce. Like the thaumatrope, which flips back and forth between two images painted on a disc attached to a string. Or flip books, which are pretty self-explanatory. And then there's the phenistikikikope, scope which consists of a spinning disc, some holes, and a mirror. I don't know how it works. The praxinoscope, which functions pretty much identically to a zoetrope, but with mirrors instead of slits. And the zoo praxiscope, which is another spinning disc, but this time run through a projector. Anyway, no matter where you slice it, animation is old and it only got more advanced from there. So the inventor of the praxinoscope was a guy named Charles Emil Reynard, who went on to create the first animated motion pictures. In 1892, he used a device called the Optic Theater in order to project three short films, which he had hand-painted onto thin pieces of transparent gelatin. The only one still around is called Poor Pete. In 1902, Edwin S. Porter directed a motion picture called Fun in a Bakery Shop, which also included some of the first instances of claymation. In other words, stop animation made from clay models. It was, of course, incorporated into a live-action scene. In 1905, Segundo de Chomón, who also invented the dolly, directed a film called The Electric Hotel, in which similar technology allowed luggage to unpack itself. But the very first animated picture that was actually printed on movie film was called The Humorous Phases of Funny Faces. It featured photographs of hand-drawn figures that were drawn onto a blackboard. Which is kind of cool. I mean, the first animated film was drawn with chalk? Who knew? The first fully animated film, I guess if you don't count anything I've said so far, was in 1908 called The Phantasm or Yi. The movie was first drawn on paper and then photographed onto negative film. So I don't know, my research says that this was the first film to use traditional animation techniques, but that sounds kind of pretentious to me. And then there was the era of cartoons, which were largely based on the idea of newspaper comics coming to life. William McKay came into popularity with his pictures Little Nemo in Slumberland and Gertie the Dinosaur. Of course, the most popular cartoon at the time was Felix the Cat, created by Pat Sullivan. First premiering in 1919, these shorts featured one of the first animated characters created specifically for the screen. And then, what you've probably all been waiting for at this point, Walt Disney entered the scene. With his company Laughograms and upstart animator Ub Ewerks at his side, he started making cartoons like 1992's Little Red Riding Hood. And then, of course, came his famous series of Alice comedies, which were still experimenting with the idea of blending animation and live action. Then he went bankrupt. So, working at Universal Studios, he and Ub Ewerks created Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, Disney's first popular animated character, which he never owned the rights to. So having to give up Oswald, Disney, and Ewerks moved on to something you're probably a little bit more familiar with, Mortimer Mouse, which Disney's wife almost immediately renamed Mickey. You may have seen him before. Mickey Mouse was not the first animated character, the first Disney character, even the first name chosen for the character, but he was in the first cartoon ever to be synced with sound, 1928's Steamboat Willie. which wasn't even the first Mickey Mouse short, but we've got a whole nother video that talks about that. Another studio that was doing stuff with cartoons was Fleischer Studios, who had created Betty Boop and Popeye, amongst other projects. Oh, and Warner Brothers was starting to develop early versions of the Looney Tunes. You may have heard of them. Of course, Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck were not introduced until the late 1930s. So yeah, animation in the 1920s was all about cartoon characters like Mickey Mouse, Betty Boop, and Felix the Cat. And the incorporation of sound. But you know, that was kind of a big thing in all movies back then. In fact, according to my film textbook, the process of syncing sound to what's happening on screen is actually called Mickey Mousing after the technique that was first used in Steamboat Willie. <laughs> and then perfected in the Silly Symphony series. Hey, let's talk about color. It's debated what the first film animated in color actually was, but the only one that still exists today is called Fiddlesticks. Created by Ub Ewerks and MGM, Fiddlesticks not only introduced a process of two-toned technicolor, but also incorporated sound. So even if it wasn't the first cartoon in color, it was still the first cartoon in color with synced sound. 
so that's cool. The first animated feature film came out in 1926 and was called The Adventures of Prince Ahmed. But the first full-length feature animated film was actually Walt Disney's Snow White in 1937. And Walt Disney slowly began to move away from animation and shorts into their golden and silver ages of movie animation, the rest of the industry was still focused on creating classic characters and shows. Walter Lance Studios worked with Charles Mintz, who had the rights to Oswald the Rabbit, to continue those shorts. And they also introduced new characters like Woody the Woodpecker. <laughs> And now that we're approaching the 1940s, we run into the Hanna-Barbera era and their first hit, Tom and Jerry, who first premiered in a MGM short called Puss Gets the Boot, where neither of them was actually named Tom or Jerry. But they definitely had time to develop the characters a little further since the original run of the series was until the late 1950s. In 1941, there was a huge labor strike in the Disney Corporation, leading to some animators breaking away and forming the United Productions of America. America, whose work was distributed by Columbia Pictures, and the biggest project to come out of here was probably Mr. Magoo. And then, there was TV. You can probably guess this made animation even more popular than ever. NBC produced the first animated television show, Crusader Rabbit, which was created by animator Jay Ward. But the real superpower of 1950s cartoons was the Hanna-Barbera duo, who by now had left MGM to start their own company. Huckleberry Hound ran from 1948 to 1962, the Flintstones from 1960 to 1966, Yogi Bear from 61 to 62, and the Jetsons from 62 to 63. And of course, the original Scooby-Doo cartoon that ran from 1969 to 1970, all on a budget of circus peanuts. And since we're in the 70s, Jim Henson's Muppet creations became really popular, but those probably don't count as animation anyway. I don't know. It's worth mentioning. Of course, also during this time, the popular Peanuts comic strip was being adapted into the Charlie Brown specials that we all love. A Charlie Brown Christmas came out in 1965, and it's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown a year later. There's more, but we need to move on. On the topic of holiday specials, though, Rankin and Bass were producing their films in the 60s. So all that lovely stop motion that probably haunts some part of your childhood, like Rudolph and Frosty the Snowman, was produced in this time as well. Man, TV really was killing movies. Well, now that we're in the 1970s, let's address Disney's Dark Age. Because after Walt Disney's death, all they managed to produce were flops. I mean, Black Cauldron? Nuff said. But from the depths of Disney's suffering arose a new challenger in the world of movie animation. Don Bluth, who left Disney in the 80s to produce his own productions like The Secret of Nim, The Land Before Time, An American Tale, and All Dogs Go to Heaven. He also animated the popular arcade game Dragon Slayer, which is hard to play but pretty to look at. One of his last semi-popular films was Anastasia, and part of Don Bluth's eventual downfall was that Disney had picked itself up by the bootstraps and came back swinging with the Disney renaissance in the 1990s. Apart from being an incredible series of animated movies that saved the company, the Disney Renaissance is also notable for its incorporation of CGI into traditional animation. It's the chandelier shot in Beauty and the Beast, the Cave of Wonders in Aladdin, the Wildebeest in The Lion King, etc, etc. Tarzan in particular was impressive for its use of a new technique called Deep Canvas, which was later more heavily used in films like Treasure Planet. CGI was also becoming more popular in TV as well, like with Warner Brothers' opening intro of Batman Mask of the Phantasm, which was the successor to the massively popular Batman the Animated Series. Oh yeah, the late 80s and 90s were a great time for animated cartoons and television. With Warner Brothers, you had Tiny Toons, The Animaniacs, Superman, and later Pinky and the Brain. The Disney Afternoon featured DuckTales, Gargoyles, Tailspin, and Darkwing Duck. And Fox Kids had Beast Wars, Spider-Man, Beetlejuice, and of course, the X-Men. And also, back again to movies, the 90s also saw the rise in popularity of Tim Burton-esque stop animation. Stuff like The Nightmare Before Christmas, Corpse Bride, and James and the Giant Peach, which would later lead to films like Coraline and Paranorman. But you know what else came out of the mid-90s? Toy Story. Starting out as one of the computer graphics departments of Lucasfilm and partially founded by Steve Jobs, 
because every company you've ever heard of is connected. Pixar Studios and a guy named Ed Catmull invented a new software program called Renderman, which was instrumental in changing CGI and animation forever. After a few shorts, Pixar became the first studio to ever create a full-length, fully computer-animated movie, aka Toy Story. This was partially funded, produced, and distributed by Walt Disney Feature Animation, which started the relationship between the two companies. And Disney would eventually just buy them in 2006. Anyway, I could go on for hours talking about the evolution of Pixar animation. But since I have to move quickly, just know that it basically ensured that CGI animation was the future for the entire industry. So, partially from the success at Pixar and the horrible leadership going on at Disney, a Disney executive named Jeffrey Katzenberg broke off from the company to start his own with Steven Spielberg and David Geffen called DreamWorks SKG. And in 1998, they created the second CGI animated movie called Ants because Katzenberg stole the idea from Pixar. But then A Bug's Life destroyed Ants at the box office a few weeks later. Then DreamWorks made a few 2D animated movies like Prince of Egypt and The Road to El Dorado. And then in 2001, they produced Shrek. Um. And haven't really turned back from their new brand of slightly crass computer animated Disney mocking films. Well, except Spirit, which came out in 2002 and remains an anomaly. Okay, the early 2000s of animation is pretty much marked by new technology and the competition between Pixar and DreamWorks. In terms of TV, though, Nickelodeon had become a bigger thing, especially with Nicktoons. SpongeBob and the Fairly Odd Parents are probably their two biggest productions and both premiered at the turn of the century. Cartoon Network also became a thing around this time. Dexter's Lab, The Powerpuff Girls, Codename Kids Next Door, and Johnny Bravo. All things I was not allowed to watch as a kid. You know, after three centuries, you'd think that the last ten years would be kind of a home stretch, but there's still a lot to cover here. Let's start with Disney. After a lackluster early 2000s, they hit their stride again with their own series of computer animated films. Stuff like Tangled, Big Hero 6, Moana, and Zootopia. And also, you know, Frozen. Let it go! In terms of television, their channel Disney XD has had some big hits like Phineas and Ferb, Gravity Falls, and Star vs. the Forces of Evil. Their two biggest competitors continued to be Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network with shows like Avatar The Last Airbender and Steven Universe respectively. And I'm sure you've heard of Cartoon Network's Adventure Time. Following the paths of Pixar and DreamWorks, new computer animated production companies are popping up everywhere. Owned by Universal, Illumination's first film Despicable Me premiered in 2010 and launched one of the most infuriating franchises ever. Blue Sky had already already been around a while as Fox's animation department, which means I'm pretty sure they're owned by Disney now. Anyway, their biggest franchise is Ice Age, while their best movie is probably Peanuts. While Warner Brothers has always been primarily based in television, they've been doing quite well with the Lego Movie series. And people have been giving a lot of credit to Sony Animation lately for producing Into the Spider-Verse. Which, like, yeah, is possibly one of the best animated films ever. But let's not jump to conclusions here. Before that, Sony's biggest projects were the Smurfs, Angry Birds, and the Emoji Movie. So on that note, that is everything I could possibly fit into a video called A Brief History of Animation. There is so, so, so much more, but I need to stop somewhere. Oh, I didn't even get to talk about sequels, spinoffs, and reboots. Or anime! How did I forget anime? Maybe that's a video for another day. Hey, if you like this video, why don't you give us a like and subscribe to this channel for more content Kinda like this, but with more Disney, if you can imagine. You can also follow us on Twitter at theory underscore central to discover the true meaning of life. Don't quote me on that. You can also leave a comment in the section down below. No one ever takes me up on that, but it is the easiest way to interact with this channel. We like hearing from you guys. Anyway, I need to sleep or eat or do anything other than research animation for a while. So thank you for watching, but I'll see you later. <laughs>